All right, next up we have a longtime friend of the community, Fun Size, giving a talk on electronic harmony, drawing better circuits schematics. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. So uh, this talk is basically what I have been doing for the past two years. So what I want to talk about today is how you can draw better circuit schematics. So the majority of time when you see these schematics online, they are, um, you know, if you look at Arduino, Raspberry Pi, any of the major open source tools, uh, the, the schematics are available. You can look at them, they're completely open, but they're often difficult to decipher. So what I want to do today is present a better way of doing that. Um, so why should this community care about a better way of drawing schematics? One is because they're the lifeblood of hardware design and reverse engineering. So um, it's, it's where the project starts and the less confusion and issues that you have in that schematic, the less issues you'll have down the line with PCB design, with debugging, and then finally with communicating what you've done to other people in the community. Why am I up here? Why am I talking about this? Because I am an electrical engineer by day. This is my job. Um, hopefully I'm not terrible at my job, although it's possible you can judge uh, after this talk. So I work for a company where we do really high reliability electronics. Um, they are things that cannot fail and we go to great lengths to make sure that those boards and boxes that they go in are uh, incredibly well built to, to not have any of the issues. When you're working in large teams and rapidly developing those types of schematics, you can't have confusing schematics. So I spend a lot of time throughout my day reviewing other people's schematics uh, and improving my schematics so that they're more easily understood. Also, the way that I'm going to present to you is very much my way of doing things. So if you think that you have a better idea for how to communicate those ideas or you have a very specific way that you like to, to do things, it's do that. Don't follow my way, but I just want to give you some ideas on the best way to, to build some of those schematics. So what is the purpose of a schematic? For those of you who are new to hardware design or maybe you've been doing this for a while, a schematic is the drawing of the electrical idea. It is specifically to communicate that idea and it's to show circuit flow and to show the data path. The most important takeaway from this presentation that you can have is that a schematic is not the layout. So a layout is the copper design that you give to the board manufacturer and that board manufacturer will take that copper design and etch it out or mill it out and that's what becomes your PCB. That's a really important component but that's not what schematics are for. Schematics are for the, the designers and the designers are trying to communicate a circuit idea not a copper layout. Sometimes those are the same person, right? So where I work I do schematics and then I actually hand those schematics off to a CAD designer and then that CAD designer translates that circuit idea into uh, the copper files that we send off to the board house. Um, a lot of that is because they spend all day every day using the CAD tools that we have to, um, to, to, to build those boards. They're really fast at it. They're much better at it than I could be if I spent if I, if I didn't spend 40 hours a week working on it. But what that means is that it's incredibly crucial for me to take that idea and communicate it clearly because oftentimes either the CAD guys are not engineers or if, if my idea is poorly communicated, they're not going to know what I was trying to accomplish. So a schematic is not a layout. So let's dig into what is a schematic and what are some of the best practices for how that should work. So some basic rules. A, sch a schematic's laid out on a sheet. Uh, personally, I really like 11 by 17. Most people are switching towards 8 and a half on a, by 11 inches on their scale. These things don't matter. What does matter is that as you're flowing from left to right, you want your inputs and your outputs of your idea 
to, to have a, a logical pattern in the same way that we read sentences or um, translate text, right? So sometimes you have inputs that are both inputs and outputs. Then what do you do? Then you want to start grouping them by function. Uh, so if these rules seem really abstract, don't worry. I'm going to get to pretty pictures in a little bit. I just want to quickly go over some of the rules. We're going to talk about them and then I'm actually going to go through an example of a schematic that I've redone. So discrete inputs would be things like sensors, buttons, um, oscillators, crystals. Those are things that only have one purpose. They are flowing either power or data into the rest of your circuit. Outputs. This is things like screen outputs, um, uh, one-way data buses, those types. Oh, uh, LEDs, right? That's, that is an output. So those you want on the right side of your schematic. I keep gesturing uh, to my right and left. So I'm sorry, you're just going to have to conform to my standard now. Um, so then bidirectional things are, uh, most communication protocols are bidirectional. So I2C, SPI, um, you know, Ethernet, all of those, you can't nail down a single signal to, yes, this only flows one direction. So then you have to go to what is the intent of that pin. So if I have an Arduino board that reads in an Ethernet packet and spits out that status on an LED, my input are the Ethernet pins. Even though the Arduino could be communicating with the computer, that's bidirectional, but that will go on the left side of my schematic. And then on the right side of my schematic, the output is the LED. So one uh, particularly irksome thing for electrical engineers is when microphones fall. No, is when uh, grounds are not drawn down. It, guys, it really hurts me. Please don't do it. Um, so when we're communicating voltages inside of a schematic, you want this to make sense. So current flows from high voltage to low voltage, right? So if you have a high voltage source and a ground, the high voltage source to go up high, the ground should go on the bottom of the schematic. You should always draw things in the direction of the voltage as they're descending. And I actually have some particularly well-drawn examples of this. So uh, conversely, if you have a pull-down resistor, so uh, if sometimes in a circuit you want the ability to, when a, a pin on an integrated circuit is not being used, you want to make sure that it's, it's well grounded, so you use a pull down. Uh, pull downs should always go down because you're trying to communicate, it's just a resistor, right, but it, it has a very fundamental task inside of a schematic. So make sure that your pull downs go down. Make sure conversely that your pull ups go up and you want your voltage pins to also go up. I've seen grounds drawn sideways. I've seen voltage pins drawn sideways. I've seen grounds drawn up and down on the same pin. Don't do it. Don't do it. Another thing that's really important is I'm going to show you an example of a single page schematic that I expanded out to a multi page schematic. The reason this is really important is because when you try to cram everything onto one page, it becomes unreadable. So when you have signals that go between pages, if you don't label where those signals are going, you're going to get lost very quickly. So not only do you want to label all of your nets, that's the word for um, when a signal runs off of the page and goes onto another page. Um, and you want to make sure that any place that net is used is numbered right next to where that net runs off. Most CAD tools will do this for you if you configure them properly, but I've seen so many schematics where the line just ends. I, I don't know where that goes. That doesn't help me. So um, always put page numbers at the end of your nets. And then this should kind of go without saying, but please be consistent in how you name things and how you use symbols because you would be amazed at how clearly you can communicate something if the format stays inside of those traditional, like I always use this symbol for a resistor. Then if you use a different symbol, it means something different. It doesn't just confuse your audience. 
so the other thing is you want to clearly label your nets with function. So um, in a lot of CAD tools, you have a certain number of characters that you can use to describe the net. You don't have to get crazy. You don't have to say um, Ethernet for red box two. That's too long of a name and it's not helpful and you're not going to want to type that over and over. But if you say ETH2, that's incredibly more descriptive than a variable name that is either random characters or random numbers. So in, in the same way that you need good variables in software, you need good variables in your schematic design. And then this, this one is another one of those soul crushing things. Please orient your nets so that they all face normally. They're not 90 degrees off. They're not upside down. Yes, I understand that maybe you're trying to, if you have a, a line that goes up and down and you want to put a net there, it's tempting to, to angle it like that. You shouldn't have to do this with your schematic when you're writing it out. And then you want to differentiate between um, bypass caps and filter caps, kind of by the same reason. So when I'm looking at a schematic and I'm tilting my head to try to figure out what your capacitor is doing, that means that you haven't been consistent with how you've been using them. So for a lot of integrated circuits, you need a certain amount of capacitance um, to keep filtered noise out. Uh, you are essentially using those as a buffer for when you have a noisy power signal or startup conditions that are causing your current to fluctuate. Those are called bypass capacitors. Bypass capacitors should always be drawn down similar to grounds because what you're doing is you're using that to pull the AC ripple in your circuit uh, hopefully to zero or within some acceptable tolerance. Uh, but then if you have a bunch of capacitors that are for filtration, it doesn't make as much sense to draw them down unless your schematic is drawn in such a way where it makes a lot of sense. And we'll see an example of this when I pull up the schematic that I've redone. Um, and then sort of alluding back to the last thing that I spoke about, don't crowd your pages too much. Uh, when you're having trouble fitting everything onto a single page, it means that everyone else is going to have trouble reading what you squeezed in there. So another thing that I see on almost every open source hardware project is they want to draw their integrated circuits the exact same way that it's laid out on the page. Uh, excuse me, the way that it's laid out uh, pin-wise in the real world. And I understand where you're coming from, which is you want to be able to see, like here's an IC, it's got 20 pins, five per side, and you, you, you would expect to see those pins in order around your square, right? But this is, goes back to a schematic is not a layout. So if we follow the rules that we spoke about earlier and the convention of flowing your voltages down, you'd put your power pins on top, you put your ground pins on bottom, and then you'd have your input pins on the left and your output pins on the right. So we can see here uh, with my, my highly professional drawing that the five volt is on top. If I have multiple voltages, I put them all on top and I draw the label for those things at heights respective to their voltages. If I have multiple grounds inside of a circuit, um, you are gonna either draw those grounds at different levels or much better is you should use the conventional uh, nomenclature for varying types of grounds. And we'll cover that in just a little bit. Okay, so I covered a bunch of rules. So what I wanted to do was an audience exercise. So I'm gonna need some participation from you. Um, this is the Arduino Rev3. I know on this screen that it's super itty bitty. If you bear with me for a moment, I'm gonna zoom in. Um, and what I'd like to do, so on the left, I have the rules that we just talked about. And I would really like it if uh, people in the audience would call out things that are wrong with this schematic. My goal is not to um, make fun of Arduino. Uh, they are an excellent product that gets people into circuitry and I'm all about that. I think that's very exciting. But this is not the way to do schematics. And it, it, I, the further that I got into this schematic, <sighs> the more it hurt me. So uh, let's take a look here. So let's start maybe at the top. So does anybody see anything that could be improved maybe? Okay, so 
uh, the, the, one of the things pointed out is what's with the nets on the top left? So there's some pins and they're labeled and they don't go anywhere. They don't go to an IC. There's a number there that doesn't, I, I genuinely do not know what those are supposed to go to. Now I'm, I'm, this is some sort of bypass capacitor because of its size and because it's attached between three volt and ground, excuse me, five volt and ground, but it doesn't tell me what I need. How about any, anything else? What else do you see? Yeah, so the, the text is, is sideways, it's going up, it's confusing. Um, let's step down, so that's, that's just the power section. Let's take a look at this USB microcontroller. That's, that's as close as we're going to get, folks. Um, so there's, there's some grounds buried and drawn down in here. There are, what else we got going on? Can, can, you, can you read this? Now, some of that is because of the text, or the, the size of the image, but that's not really the core root of the problem here. The core root of the problem is that they jammed their entire schematic onto one page, and you can't see what's going on. So, um, uh, for brevity, I uh, made some of my own red lines, and I just want to show you what those looked like. So there's more red on this page than there is schematic. And this is, I'm, I may be uh, slightly OCD about these things, but the company that I work at, I'm considered to be somewhat lackadaisical. Uh, my, the, my team, if they, if they spent more than five minutes on this, could find at least 20 more problems. Four-way junctions. Four junctions, exactly. <laughs> This, okay, so this is, I'm so glad that the younger members of the audience uh, are, are, know what they're talking about. So let's dive into this a little bit. <laughs> so the pin numbers are there twice. It doesn't clearly communicate what's going on. Um, in, in the middle, I actually have a laser pointer that I can use. So over on uh, here, there are three circles. I have no idea what their circles are. They're probably mounting holes. It's not labeled. I don't know. They could be transports to another dimension. Uh, in here is, these are uh, voltage transformers. They, they, they take it from uh, a higher voltage to a lower voltage. They're not in order. It, according to this schematic, the way it works is it steps from V in, which is generally somewhere around 12 volt, to 3.3 volt, back down to 5 volt, uh, and then it jumps back out to VN. So then they've got their, their power uh, pins buried in there. Very hard to see, very hard to read. Here they have, they're using a whole bunch of pins that are unlabeled. They are uh, crowding up the box. You can't like, right in this area, that's where the power is. I can't, I, I, if I looked at this circuit, I would immediately be lost. It took me longer than 20 minutes to really sit down and figure out what they were trying to do with this. So here they have unnecessary jogs. Uh, here is what the young gentleman in the front was talking about. It's a four-way. So this is something that we uh, really like to avoid in schematics is when you have two lines and they cross and they connect, you don't ever want that to be a four-way intersection. And the reason for that is because we're, gonna, we're following a nomenclature here, which is now the standard nomenclature of when a trace, excuse me, when a trace crosses another trace, it doesn't jump over. That was a 1960s uh, style jump. It's bad. It, it makes it hard to read. Um, so now when two lines cross, they just cross. If they connect, if there is an electrical connection at that point, you have a dot. So the way you get around having four ways is you uh, turn them into three ways that are right next to one another. And I'm going to show an example of this in just a second. Okay, so here's what I did. I redid it in a 
tool agnostic setting. So uh, I didn't want people to say, oh, well, because he did that in Eagle or because he did that in Pads, that's why it was so easy. Um, I actually did this in the most irritating software known to mankind, which is Visio. So we're going to zoom in and take a look at this. What I did is this is where power comes into the circuit. So this is page one of my circuit. There's the barrel adapter. There's the voltage regulator. And oh look, I labeled what each functionality does with a text box. Um, we're gonna come over here. We now can see I've got my five volt rail and my 3.3 rail. I didn't have to dig for this. It's really obvious. And more importantly, the grounds are all at exactly the same height, which is one of those things where you don't have to do it, but it does make me twitchy. So things that are good about this schematic, there's no four ways. These are all three ways. Here's an example of where you can break a four way into two three ways, where you just put them right next to each other. Uh, you'll notice that my V in is drawn the highest, and then 5 volt, and then 3, 3 volt. When you look at this, you can immediately tell what voltages those are just by looking at the heights. Down below, I have another grouping. So these were sort of the, um, the weird uh, little addendum circuits that they have. They're not necessarily core functionality, but the very first one, if you take a look, it's 5 volt USB, and then it's a, a VN power selector. So it's a comparator that's figuring out whether or not you have the device plugged into 5 volt. This is completely unintelligible in the previous schematic. Here, you can tell immediately that this is a comparator, and it is feeding into a gate that will allow current to flow. I made a mistake here. I have a net that goes off page, and I don't number it. Uh, this is fixed on the next page, I believe. But um, you know, please, if you catch stuff, I want you to practice with me. So if you see errors in my schematics, call them out, and we'll redline them. So that's page one of my schematic. All I did was redraw it in a clean way, and I didn't cram anything together. And you can immediately tell how much more visually pleasing and flowing that is. OK, so this is the uh, ICs redrawn. You can see here, 5 volt comes in. There's a bike pass capacitor. There's some uh, reverse voltage protection. There's a pull up for the reset pin. There's some power LEDs. Like, it's, it's much, much more readable. Um, and I've got my, my VCC and my AVDC uh, tied up top. They're tied together. So this means that my analog uh, reference is always going to be the same as my VCC, which is pretty standard. But here I can actually tell rather than having to guess. Just, just look at how clean this oscillator is. I'm really proud of this, in case you couldn't tell. Um, you can tell exactly what's going on with this oscillator. Notice how clean my pins are. They come out in the right direction. There's no jogs. Because I expanded my uh, square for my IC, I didn't have to cram everything really tight, and you can actually tell what each pin is doing. I have nets here that go just to the other side of the page. All it does is go from here to here. But it meant that I didn't have to draw stuff down and under my ground, because these are signal lines and they're definitely not lower than ground, and then they come back up. OK, so I wanted to give you a side-by-side -side comparison. Exhibit A. Does this one look more readable? With a little bit of practice, you will be able to just look at this and know inherently what that chip is doing. This is the USB right here. That was contained here before. I, like, there are, there are nets in this area that I don't know what they go to. Here, I know exactly where everything's going and how it's formatted. 
Uh, same thing on the other side. It, once you clean up those, those power pins and your oscillators and your communication pins, it all flows really nicely. Okay, one uh, last little tidbit. When you have an IC that has a bunch of um, pins that you're not using, you want to make sure that you list those as spares on the last page. So um, this is really just demonstrating there was, you know, there was some number of spares for the first at mega chip and um, now when I'm redoing my schematic, it's like, oh, I need that additional functionality. I can just jump to the last page and look at exactly why I need that um, uh, or, you know, what pins are left available to me. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening to me rant. Uh, I hope that you had fun. I hope that you learned some things today. Uh, are there any questions about schematic design before I go? So it's if you are either copying your schematics or you are uh, like on a, uh, a copy machine or even uh, it's just an image, you don't have access to the original schematic and you're, you're copying, pasting that, a PNG and you get artifacting. That artifacting, when it's across a point like that, can actually build up and it begins to look like an electrical connection. And so it's a, it's a way of very safely making sure that not only are you clearly communicating when there is and when there is not a cross, but also you don't get artifacting from later. All right, thanks everyone. If you want to get a hold of me, uh, the slides will be available, and uh, that's my contact info. Thank you very much. I got one more question. Oh, sorry. Are there tools in Visio that you would suggest? I really like KiCad. KiCad? Uh, it's, that's uh, Kilo India. Charlie Alpha Papa. That's uh, Charlie Alpha Delta. Uh, Eagle is no longer a community favorite, but it's still very popular. Um, pretty much anything's better than Vizio. <laughs>